So this lecture is going to be all about cells. Uh, so we, the study of cells is called cytology. So cyto meaning cell. So for starters, we'll talk about how big cells are. And these are microscopic uh, structures. So this would fall under the umbrella of microscopic anatomy. If you look at this picture right here, you can kind of see that most cells are going to fall into this size range, which is definitely uh, microscopic. You can see with a light microscope. But there are some cells that are actually bigger, and you can see with the unaided eye. So some like muscle cells, nerve cells, uh, those are actually really, really big. But for the most part, these are things that you cannot see with the naked eye. So this is a picture of what we might call a typical cell or a normal cell, even though there probably is no cell that looks exactly like this. But it has all of the characteristics that you'll see in, in many cells. So the big things I want to point out here are that there's a barrier going around it. And this is called the cell membrane or plasma membrane, sometimes called the plasma lemma. And then there's a control center in the middle. This is called the nucleus. And then there's all this stuff in between. And all this stuff in between is called the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm consists of a lot of water. And you see that in here, which is commonly known as the cytosol. And then you have all these structures in here. These are organelles. And there's different types of organelles. And we're, we're going to spend a lot of time in this lecture going through the different organelles. So general characteristics of cells, they have a barrier called a plasma membrane going around it. There's a nucleus, and, and there are cells, most cells are going to have one nucleus. Some cells have more than one, and some cells don't have any. But for the most part, the cells are going to have one nucleus. And then the cytoplasm, we said, is everything in between. So it consists of the cytosol, which is the fluid, the organelles, which are the tiny structures in there. And then the something called inclusions. This is kind of a general term for things that are found inside the cytoplasm that don't fit into these categories. So it could be uh, like nutrients, carbohydrates, or fats, or anything like that. Anything included in the cell that is not an organelle or is not the fluid. So let's start with the plasma membrane. It's made up of a lot of fat or lipid, carbohydrate, and also a little bit of protein. So the bulk of this is going to be fat, though. So these structures right here are called phospholipids. We'll look at those in some detail. And um, these other structures that you see, so these are proteins. These are carbohydrates. So all of these things together make up the plasma membrane. So the first thing that you should note about this is that it has two layers. So we call it a lipid bilayer. And the phospholipids are making up that lipid bilayer. And we can look at it a little closer like this. So the phospholipids are these things. And if you zoom in on one of these phospholipids, you can see there's many of these. But if you zoom in on one, we'll just take this one, you can see that it has a head, and that's where the phosphate would be. And then there's two tail regions. These are called fatty acids. So two fatty acid tails and a head made of phosphate. So the head is classified as being hydrophilic, which means that it loves water. The tails are hydrophobic, which means they don't like water. They want to get away from water. And so what happens here is due to that, you get fluid on both sides of the cell. So let's say this is outside the cell, this is inside the cell. There's fluid here, there's fluid here, so the heads kind of orient themselves towards the fluid and the tails go towards each other in the middle. And that gives us the formation of this lipid bilayer. The, the, another term that's used to describe the plasma membrane is the fluid mo mosaic model. So fluid mosaic model. And that just means it's very fluid. So if you look at this picture again, you can see that it doesn't look like it's very rigid kind of looks like it's wavy and if you were able to touch it uh, or manipulate it it might move a little bit kind of like a waterbed and so that it's, it's very flexible and so they call it a fluid mosaic model other structures inside the uh, making up the cell membrane are cholesterol so cholesterol would be this structure right here cholesterol is actually another form of fat and um, it is basically, we'll 
talk a little bit about this later in the semester, but it's actually classified as uh, a steroid, which has this four ring structure. But its role here is that it helps maintain the strength of the cell membrane. So cholesterol does get a bad rap for its role in cardiovascular disease, but cells do need a little bit, and that's what you're seeing here. So the cholesterol in the cell that's necessary does increase the strength of the cell membrane. Proteins, so there's two different types of proteins you'll find associated with the plasma membrane. So if a protein goes all the way across the cell membrane, it's called integral. If it's only on one side of the cell membrane here, or it could be on this side also, it's known as peripheral. So integral proteins go all the way across, peripheral proteins stay on one side. The importance of these integral proteins, a lot of them form channels that allow things to get through. And some are actually gonna serve as what we call transport proteins, which also get things through, but in a slightly different way. So we'll have that discussion next. Other structures, uh, before, well, I guess before we leave proteins, some proteins act as enzymes. You'll learn more about enzymes in physiology, but enzymes speed up chemical reactions. So if you've ever taken a chemistry class and you learned about chemical reactions, enzymes speed those up. Some of these proteins can act as enzymes and help facilitate metabolic reactions occurring. All right, so other things, glycolipids, glycoproteins. So glyco refers to sugar or carbohydrate. So if you have a protein like this and you have carbohydrates attached, that's called a glycoprotein. If there's none shown here, but if you had carbohydrates attached to a, one of these lipids, that would be a glycolipid. So you do get carbohydrates on the surface of the cell, either attached to the, the lipids or the protein. This is important for cell, cell communication and cell signaling. All right, so we need to have a discussion on how to get things across the cell membrane. So the plasma membrane is selectively permeable which basically means that some things, some things can get across and some things can't. So there's two strategies that cells use to get things across. One's called active transport, the other is called passive transport. And we'll start with passive, and so passive transport does not require any energy. Right? And so what you're gonna see shortly is that the energy within cells comes from a molecule called ATP. So ATP is not necessary for passive transport. So we have three s different examples of this that I wanna go through. So the first one is called simple diffusion, and it basically means that things are gonna move down their concentration gradient. And what I mean by that is things are gonna move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So if we take this picture up here, if we just assume that this is a cell membrane, and let's say these purple dots are sodium molecules. There's, you can clearly see there's more sodium here than over here. So just based on what is, what is naturally gonna happen, the sodium molecules are gonna move in this direction from a high concentration to a low concentration. Now, we're assuming that that sodium can get through the membrane via a, a channel or maybe it's just, maybe whatever molecule it is can actually just get right through the cell membrane, which is possible. But that's less important now than understanding that if something like this, like a molecule moves from a high concentration to a low concentration, that's just called simple diffusion. That does not require energy, it just happens naturally. And it's gonna go across until the sides are equal. So that's simple diffusion. Osmosis is similar, but we're specifically talking about water. So if we look at this example, so if we start here, and we're gonna end up here in a moment, but let's, just for the sake of this, let's say that water can get through this barrier right here. So we'll say this is the cell membrane in this case, or selectively permeable membrane. So at the beginning, it looks like the levels are the same for water, but there's different amounts of these molecules in here. So there's definitely more of the purple dots here than here. So what does that mean with the, as far as water? So if the water levels are the same, then there's definitely more water here than here because 
some of the, the spaces are being taken up by these purple dots. So we can say that there's a higher concentration of water here than here. So if water moves down its concentration gradient, meaning from high water to low water, water is going to move in this direction. Now we're assuming those purple dots can't get across this membrane. We're assuming that water can. So what's going to happen is water is going to move in this direction from a high concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. And so you end up with something like this. That's called osmosis. So osmosis by definition is the diffusion of water from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water. Facilitated diffusion is our last one under passive I want to talk about. So this is a, an example of facilitated diffusion. So this is not a channel. So a channel would just be open or look open the whole way through. You can see that in this protein, this is an integral protein in the cell membrane, that this part down here is kind of closed. And then it, it, this whole protein kind of changes shape throughout this process. So facilitated diffusion occurs when a, a molecule is moved from, it's still high concentration to low concentration, but it doesn't just simply flow through. A, something called a transport protein, such as this, has to physically grab it and pull it across. And that still does not require energy because you're going from a high concentration to a low concentration. But nevertheless, it's different from simple diffusion because the transport protein has to physically grab it and pull it across. So moving to active transport, active transport requires energy, and that energy comes in the form of something called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And so I have a couple of, or three, uh, actually two major classifications with some subheadings, uh, examples of active transport. So we'll talk about ion pumps, and then we'll talk about what's called bulk transport. So let's hit the ion pumps first. So Anytime you hear the word pump on a cell membrane, it basically means it's going to do some work. It's going to pump something, which generally means it's going against its concentration gradient. So that would mean moving from a low concentration to a high concentration. So in this example, this is probably the most common ion pump that we have. It's called the sodium potassium pump. It looks, it's a transport protein embedded in the cell membrane. And you can see how it's changing shape through this process like we saw with facilitated diffusion. The difference is this requires energy because it's pumping things against the direction that they naturally want to go. So the sodium potassium pump takes three sodium ions, grabs them, moves them out of the cell, and then right after that grabs two potassium ions and pulls them into the cell. And both of these are moving against their concentration gradients from low concentration to high concentration. And so since it's going against the concentration gradients, it requires energy. And this, that's where the ATP comes in. So key point, ion pumps pump ions against their concentration gradients, moving them from a low concentration to a high concentration. And it requires ATP for energy. So going back to this other stuff, so you can see exocytosis, endocytosis. This is best described in pictures, but exocytosis is just where things are, several things together are just moved out of the cell. And I have a picture that I want to show you. This is exocytosis. So let's say this stuff in this vesicle we wanted to get out of the cell. So anything you want to get out of the cell via exocytosis, you put it in a vesicle like this and that vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, and then it just eliminates its stuff out of the cell. So that's exocytosis. Endocytosis is a little bit different, and there's two um, major examples of this that I wanted to get through. So phagocytosis and pinocytosis. So let me just go back to this list again. So endocytosis in general means moving things into the cell. And then 
if the bulk of what's coming in is solid particles, we call it phagocytosis or cell eating. If it's mainly fluid, we call it pinocytosis or cell drinking. And then we'll come back to receptor mediated. So let's take a look at those two really quick. So this would be phagocytosis. So there's a big solid particle. It looks like the cell membrane just kind of uses the fluidity that it has and goes out, grabs it, and then pulls it into a vesicle inside the cell. Pinocytosis, mainly fluid, kind of the doesn't really reach out. It looks like the cell membrane just kind of opens up and lets it come in and then pinches the vesicle off inside the cell. So key point, phagocytosis, eating, pinocytosis, drinking. Then this other example of receptor-mediated endocytosis. It's very similar to pinocytosis in that it kind of like brings in things into the cell. However, it's more specific. And so if you look at the surface of the cell membrane, there is these little yellow things. These are receptors and they're very specific. So if you look closely there, these receptors are only attaching to the blue particles. They're not specific for anything else. And so those receptors allow to the cell to get things in and uh, in a very specific manner. So out of all of these, the most specific mechanism of getting things into the cell is receptor mediated endocytosis. All right, so that's it for the, uh, for the cell membrane. So let's move on to the cytoplasm. Remember the cytoplasm had three major parts, the cytosol, which is mostly, mostly fluid, uh, inclusions, which is just anything inside the cell other than cytosol or organelles, and then organelles. So the cytosol is basically the fluid, the inclusions, basically anything temporarily stored in the cell, like carbohydrates as glycogen or fats. Uh, could be a pigment, giving a cell a certain color, like in the skin. And then organelles are the structures where we're going to spend the time, most of the time on. So there's membrane bound, non membrane bound. That's not overly important. So we're just going to go through these organelles and talk about their functions and what they look like. So we're going to start with something called the endoplasmic reticulum. And there's two parts to it a rough and a smooth. So if you look at this picture right here, here's the nucleus that we'll get to, but this is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And so we're going to start with the rough because it, so it's a series of flattened sacs. The sacs are called cisterni, this word right here, cisterni. And it's, it looks rough because it has all these dots on it. These dots are called ribosomes. And the rough, rough endoplasmic reticulum, which we'll call it the rough ER, attaches directly to the nucleus. So the importance of the rough ER are the ribosomes that it has, all these dots. So the ribosomes produce proteins. They're important in protein synthesis, so making proteins. So that's the main job of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It makes proteins via the ribosomes that it has. When the proteins are made here, they're sent to another organelle called the Golgi apparatus, which we'll get to shortly. So the only other thing I was going to point out here, this is an electron microscope uh, picture of the rough ER. So you can see the cisterni, the flattened sacs, and then all the dots that you kind of see around it tell us that it's the rough ER. So there's another picture. It's smooth ER does not have any ribosomes, so it has a smooth appearance. Uh, doesn't have, since it doesn't have ribosomes, doesn't make any proteins, but it helps synthesize fats or lipids and also is, has a role in detoxification of some, of some substances within the cell. All right, so that's the endoplasmic reticulum. Moving on to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus also is a series of these flattened sacs called cisterni. Its job is to modify, package, and sort proteins arriving from the rough ER. So the proteins that are made on the rough ER go to the Golgi apparatus where the, uh, their, the finishing touches are put on them. So it basically finishes the proteins off. So there's two ends, a cis end or cis face and a trans face. The cis end 
receives and then the trans phase shifts out. So in other words, the proteins would come into the cis phase from the rough ER and then leave via the trans phase. It's like a sorting factory. So this is a good picture of what's going on. So here's the rough ER making proteins. Those proteins are sent to the Golgi apparatus. So this is the cis phase. The proteins make their way through the Golgi apparatus and they're shipped off from the trans phase. So the proteins leaving the rough ER, I'm sorry, the proteins leaving the Golgi apparatus have three options. They can be inserted into the cell membrane, as you're seeing here. They can be exported from the cell via exocytosis, or they can be put into something called lysosomes. So lysosomes are basically another organelle that we'll talk about. So the three options for proteins leaving the Golgi apparatus are going to be inserted into the cell membrane, exported from the cell, or put into a vesicle called a lysosome. Which leads us here, lysosomes, another organelle. So their membranous sacs form from the Golgi apparatus. They have enzymes to digest waste products. And so you can think of these kind of like garbage trucks. They go around the cell breaking down things that are just waste products and getting rid of things, cleaning up the cell basically. So lysosomes clean up the cell. Another organelle that's very similar to the lysosome is, are called peroxisomes. Peroxisomes are not formed from the Golgi apparatus. These are come directly from the rough ER and they can actually replicate themselves. But they're a little bit different than lysosomes because they are more focused on detoxifying harmful substances as opposed to just taking care of general waste. These target more toxic substances, but they do help clean up the cell also. One of the more important organelles that cells have are called mitochondria. Mitochondria are commonly referred to as the powerhouses of the cell because they produce tons of ATP, thus they're important for energy. So their structure, as far as their structure, they're double membrane organelles, kind of like this. Um, they produce massive, produce massive amounts of ATP via aerobic metabolism and aerobic metabolism means that they use oxygen so where oxygen is utilized in cells it occurs in the mitochondria that's why we need so much oxygen in the body so the mitochondria use it via aerobic metabolism and produce lots of ATP so the different parts of the mitochondrion uh, there's two membranes so the inner part in here is called the matrix so the matrix is the inside then there's an intermembrane space in the, between the two membranes. And then you can see the inner membrane is very folded, and those folds are called cristae. All right, so one last feature about the mitochondria, which is important. They can self-replicate. So if you take a muscle like a skeletal muscle cell uh, and you work it for a period of time, so let's say you, you started running for a while, uh, and uh, one of the things that one of the adaptations that allows you to get in better shape over time is that these mitochondria increase in number. So they can self self-replicate, and a given cell can basically double the amount of mitochondria that they have. So if you see where the relevance of that. So more mitochondria means more energy, basically, greater ability to produce ATP. So they can self-replicate, which is important. All right, so other organelles, uh, ribosomes, we talked a little bit about, but a little more detail. They're important for making proteins, so protein synthesis. Each ribosome is going to have a large and small subunit, and between the two is where proteins are actually made. So in other classes, you might go in detail into protein synthesis, and you'll talk about how um, the proteins are actually formed on the uh, on the ribosome. But for right now, let's just know that ribosomes have two units, and they make proteins. 
there's two different places they can be found. They can either be fixed, like when they're stuck to the rough ER, or they can be free, just means they're floating around the cells. So the fixed ribosomes synthesize proteins that uh, go to the Golgi apparatus and then, go, like we said earlier, go to the either inserted into the plasma membrane, exported from the cell, or go into lysosomes. The free ribosomes synthesize proteins that are going to be used within the cell. So they, those proteins just stay within the cell, within the cytoplasm of the cell. All right, other organelles, cytoskeleton, which is what it says. So it's a skeleton inside the, the cell. So all of these different structures kind of form a network of structure inside the cell to help stabilize it. So these are the filaments that are the struct the, mo the molecules that make up the cytoskeleton are microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. So you can see from this picture that the microtubules are the biggest, the microfilaments are the smallest, and the microtubules are kind of unique. And you'll see this when we talk about cell division. They can actually change their length and change shape a little bit and they have like little motors that can move things across the cell but uh, microtubules can do a lot of things they can either get longer get shorter or m actually move things across the cell so provide structural support and some transport as far as the centrosome and centrioles these are really important in cell division so cells have these so terminology wise uh, these are microtubules so same microtubules we just talked about on the previous slide they're microtubules arranged in what we call a nine plus three arrangement so there's nine groups of three and so the terminology wise when you get two perpendicular sets like that nine plus three arrangement that's called a centrosome one of these is called a centriole so a centriole looks like this if you get two centrioles that are perpendicular to each other, that's called a centrosome. These are really important in cell division. They form what we call the mitotic spindle, which we'll get to later in this lecture. All right, and then cilia and flagella. So two different structures or two different organelles, but we'll have them on the same slide. So cilia are hair-like processes that stick off of cells. These move. And you can see like one cell has several cilia and they basically move things across the cell. So if there was a substance right here and all of these cilia started moving, it could move it across the surface of the cell. And this is important, especially in the respiratory tract. If you were to inhale something that could be harmful, even if it's, if it's something like dust, uh, your cilia in your respiratory tract help move it out. Flagellum, on the other hand, uh, flagellum is singular, flagella, plural, bigger, found alone, so like this, this is one flagellum. And so the cell of the, of the human body that has this is the sperm cell in males. And so the fl a flagellum's role is to move the entire cell. So that's not written here. So you you probably have heard that sperm can swim and move through fluid. That's what the flagellum does. It moves back and forth and serves as a motor to move the entire cell. All right, and then microvilli. They kind of look like cilia at first, but they're not. So they're, these do not move. They're actually projections of the cell membrane. And it, microvilli's role is to increase surface area. So you want these microvilli where you want to maximize surface area. That in the human body, that would mainly be the digestive tract, so you can absorb lots of nutrients. And when you look at this through the microscope, it looks like a little haze or a little, little paintbrush bristle, so we call it a brush border. All right, now finally, moving to the nucleus. So the nucleus, the control center for the cells. So most cells have one, some have none. Some cells have many, like skeletal muscle has a lot of uh, nuclei. Uh, contains DNA, the genetic material, and it's surrounded by nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope, if you look closely, is also a lipid bilayer, so very similar to the cell membrane. And it's continued, continuous with the rough ER, as we saw earlier. 
um, and you see these yellow dots, those are ribosomes. So remember the rough ER had ribosomes, and so you do get ribosomes on the nuclear envelope also. So nuclear pores are these openings, and that allows things to get in and out of the nucleus. This is also important in protein synthesis when you want to get something called messenger RNA back and forth. All right, so other things about the nucleus before we talk about DNA. Uh, nuclei commonly have what's called a nucleolus, and there could be one or a few. Uh, the nucleoli, these dark spots in the nucleus, are important for making ribosomes. And you know that ribosomes make proteins. So in cells that, have, that are very uh, relevant in making proteins, you'll have several nucleoli. So it's, if you think nucleoli make the ribosomes, the ribosomes make the proteins. All right, so talking about this DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. This is found in, um, in the nucleus. It's our genetic material. So we'll talk briefly about the structure of DNA and what it looks like. So it's a double helix model, which basically mean, means it looks like a spiral staircase and there's two strands and they're held together by these bonds called hydrogen bonds. So double helix, a section of DNA is commonly referred to as a gene that encodes for something, commonly encodes for proteins. And so it's, con it's classified as a nucleic acid and a nucleic acid is a string of what we call nucleotides. So one of these could be a nucleotide. Here's a nucleotide, here's a nucleotide, here's a nucleotide. So what a nucleotide consists of is a sugar. In this case, the sugar is deoxyribose. And so we'll say this is it. A phosphate group, and then a, what we call a nitrogenous base. And there's four options for the nitrogenous bases. So thymine, adenine, cytosine, guanine. So What's going to make each nucleotide different is basically which base they have, because all nucleotides are going to have this. So the four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, and then we get two strands, like we said, and there's a bond between those bases, and that's called a hydrogen bond. And it's hydrogen bonds, if you've taken a chemistry class before, you probably learned that they're relatively weak, which is good, because at certain times you want to separate these strands. All right, the other thing I want to point out here is that there's a very organized binding here. So the adenine, which in this picture is always blue, always binds to the thymine, whereas the cytosine, which is purple, always binds to the guanine, which is yellow. So you won't get adenine bindings, binding to cytosine or guanine. So it's always adenine to thymine, cytosine to guanine. All right, and then the packaging of the DNA. DNA, in its form, wraps around these proteins called histones. You get, wraps around eight of those, and you get something called a nucleosome. And then you get a long chain of these nucleosomes, and it turns into what we call a chromatin fiber. And that's how DNA sits most of the time in a cell. So, and you can see it coils up like a telephone cord. And just before cell division, it gets very organized like this. And this is what you commonly see when you see a picture of a chromosome. An organized chromosome looks like kind of like a letter X. And as you're going to see shortly, the X is made up of what we call two sister chromatids. So basically copies of each other. So two sister chromatids make up the X, and we call this an organized chromosome. So cells are going to have 46 chromosomes, uh, and that's set up in 23 pairs. There is an exception to this. The sex cells, so that would be the sperm in the male, and the oocyte in the female are going to have 23. So 40, most cells of the body are going to have 46 chromosomes, and that they're set up as 23 pairs, whereas sperm and the egg only have 23. They're not paired up. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is cell division. 
And so the cell cycle refers to the life cycle of a cell. And depending on what type of cell you're talking about, it could go through something called mitosis or meiosis. So meiosis is what sex cells do, sperm and egg. We're not going to get into that right now. We're going to focus on what most cells undergo when they divide, and that's called mitosis. So the sex cells do meiosis, called gametes. Somatic cells, which is everything else, go through mitosis. So if we look at the cell cycle, there's two major phases going on. So from here to here is called interphase. And you can see that takes up like a little bit more than half of the time. And the rest of this is called the mitotic phase, which consists of something called mitosis and cytokinesis. So interphase is relatively straightforward. So there's three subcomponents, but not a whole lot's going on in interphase. So the phases of interphase are G1, S, G2. G stands for gap or growth. Um, and so G1, not a whole lot's going on. The cell's just growing. It's doing its everyday activities. Then when you enter the S phase, that this is important because the DNA inside the cell is replicated. So DNA is replicated. You make a copy of it. And then it, you go into a G2 phase, or second growth phase, where not a whole lot else is going on other than cell growth. And so that's it for interphase. Now, in cells that divide after the G2 phase, we'll go into the mitotic phase. In cells that don't divide, they're basically locked into this phase. And we say they're in a G0 phase. So G0 is what the phase that cells are in that do not divide. So this is supposed to be a microscopic picture of what a cell looks like in interphase. Basically, it looks like a cell with a nucleus. It doesn't look like anything spectacular. So then we go into the mitotic phase, which consists of division of the nucleus, which is called mitosis, and division of the cytoplasm, which is called cytokinesis. And then the four phases of mitosis we'll spend some time on. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And so we'll go through those in some detail. But this is basically described the process by when the cell actually divides. So splitting of the nucleus and then splitting of the cytoplasm. So starting with prophase. So prophase, a lot of things start to break down. So the chromin, chromatin gets really condensed. It's very organized into the, to those sister chromatids that we talked about. So you get two sister chromatids joined in the middle by something called a centromere. So if you look closely at this picture, you kind of see like this is a wavy looking X, but this is one sister chromatid attached to another sister chromatid. So they're copies of each other and they're held together by this little circle in the middle called the centromere. Other things going on in prophase, the nucleoli are breaking down, spindle fibers start to grow from the centrioles. So what that means is you remember the centrosomes, which are the microtubules? Those microtubules, microtubules start elongating. Remember, they can change length. And they're starting to form something called the mitotic spindle. And then other things, the nuclear envelope, so the, the, the layer around the nucleus also breaks down. So you can see, microscope-wise, it doesn't look that different than interface. So it might look a little bit darker. The nucleus might look a little bit darker. Uh, but... It looks very similar. So then we start seeing some action here. So metaphase is the next phase. The chromosomes are lining up in the middle of the cell, and that's due to these spindle fibers, to these microtubules coming out from the centrosomes. And they're basically attaching to the centromere and lining them up. So the spindle fibers attached to the centromeres line them up in the middle of the cell. And you get the formation of something called the mitotic spindle. So this big oval structure is known as the mitotic spindle. And it's formed from these spindle fibers or microtubules coming out of the centros centrosomes. So identification-wise, you can clearly see that there's a difference here. So you get that line right down the middle. So this is metaphase. Next, we have what's called anaphase. So basically in anaphase, the microtubules are gonna start recoiling and pulling back to the centrosomes. And what that's going to do is rip the 
chromosomes apart. And so one sister chromatid is going to be pulled to one side, the other sister chromatid is going to be pulled to the other side. And so what you're going to see identification wise is something like this, where you can kind of see the sister chromatids being dragged back towards the other, uh, back to each respective side of the cell. And when they stop moving, we enter the last phase, which is called telophase, where basically you're building up two new cells. So you got sister chromatids here and here. Nuclear envelopes start to form around each. The chromosomes start to kind of uncoil a little bit. The mitotic spindle starts breaking down, so all those microtubules go back, are recoiling back. And identification-wise, it kind of looks like two cells that are kind of fused together for a moment. Then as that's going on, you also get this cytokinesis, which is the splitting of the cytoplasm. So you get this little, you get a band of proteins in here that basically pinch the cell into two different cells. And so it, the, we call this a cleavage furrow. It pinches that initial cell into two separate, what we'll call daughter cells. And so then that's it, that when the cells officially are pinched apart, we have two new cells that basically came from one. 